This topic um, has me, I won't say frightened, but uh, it's, it's going to be hard for me. So I'm just telling you that I'm being very brave today to talk about finishing a painting because I always reserve the right to finish my paintings in private, in my own time, in my own space, even when I've done a workshop. Uh, well, I mean, when I've done a workshop. Um, in fact, one of my little rewards to the class members who let me have their emails and put them on my little email list is, I will send you the finished painting. <laughs> you know, nobody else may get to see it. And we also always also know that not all demo paintings turn out. It happens. Now, I had the pleasure yesterday of a nice quiet day at Nance's where I could work on it a little more and bring it up and pre-think a lot of the things. But what I'm really interested in sharing with you is more the thought process than the actual painting. I am not an entertainment painter. I'm not into performing for people while I work so much. However, I will, I promise you, I will put pastel on the painting today, so you'll get to watch that a little bit. But even in my workshop, the, the participants will tell you I'm much more interested in sharing and perhaps offering some help through the agonies that I've gone through about what's going on in here because it's all about what's going on in here that affects what happens out there. So that's one of the first points I wanted to make, is I don't believe you can start a painting, paint a painting, or finish a painting unless you have some awareness, even if you're an intuitive like I used to be, still kind of am, but the more I teach, the more of it is coming up into the frontal lobe. Um, I didn't know how I finished a painting until Nancy asked me to talk about this. Now, oh crap, what, I, what do I do? I'm going to have to figure out what I actually do to finish a painting. Same thing with what do I do for composition. So all of the things that I'm going to cover today are about questions and answers and listening. But listening to your painting as well as to yourself. So it's a conversation. I think that's what goes on at the end, particularly at the end of a painting. So I'm going to be suggesting some conversations I think you might have. But with the understanding that you can't divorce that from the action. You may stand here and say, yeah, it's coming along pretty good. And then the concern is going to be, oh man, I'm afraid I'm going to ruin it. Right? <laughs> you know, oh, it just needs, and I, I taught myself to be, I'll put the red alert sign on whenever I use the word just. It just needs five more marks. It just needs a little more green. You know, whenever you say it's just, it's like, whoa, danger, danger. But it just needs something else, and you know that you could either send it into the realms of glory or, or into the trash heap. And, and that's, this painting isn't at that point yet. I just wanted you to know. I still have some pretty good ideas about what this needs technically, and I'm going to share those with you as I do them. But I'm going to begin with a couple of things. Check it against your intent. Take that tea, you take that chocolate, take a walk, whatever it takes, <laughs> but come back and did you have an intent for this painting? I hope you did, because it is so helpful to have that at this point, at the end point of the painting. What was my intent? And, and does it? Did it? Did I? How am I doing? That's so useful, and it's so simple. But it does mean you've got to do the work beforehand to have that available to you then. Before I had words for such things as this, I would sit down and look at a painting and I don't know if you guys remember the old, oh, they were terrible, Carlos Castaneda books, the Yaki Weight of Power, or whatever they were. I read those in the 70s, like, um, but he talked about gazing, and I love the idea of gazing. It's kind of what a baby does when they don't know what they're looking at, and I think I spend half my life there. 
<laughs> and I think that's sometimes why my paintings look the way they do, because I don't really care or know if that's a rock out there. It's just a, oh, look at that. So his, the concept of gazing is sit down, turn off the brain, really, really hard to do, turn off the brain, and let the eyes and the heart and the mind do their work without you directing. Look at the painting. Just look at it. And then, after a while, observe your eyes. Observe where you're looking. As I, as, as I mosey around this painting, where do I keep going? What happens? Oh, I find myself, I'm always going to that spot. Why? Huh, okay. Oh, and then you kind of, oh, I re oh, my heart opens when I look at that part. Start observing yourself as you observe your painting. <coughs> and my final arbiter of it's done when I would be doing that, as I say before I actually tried to analyze this stuff, was I would have no tension between my eyes. <laughs> you know how you look at your paintings? You know, like what's wrong? Uh, you're squinting for value, you're checking where's my composition. And all of that involves tension right there. And when I would look at it, and there was no, and I, and I would feel, and I went, I guess it's done. There's nothing else I can do. Now, I've refined that a little bit over the years, because I, I came to the conclusion that that was a point of painting that I think was a little overworked. It was a little too calm, a little too finished, a little too perfect in all its parts. And I have taught myself to be open and accepting uh, a little more discordance, a little more, a little more jarring energy from here to there, interesting parts that are talking to each other. So that's, that's another reminder of that. So on a technical level, you may look at the painting, and I think these are the kind of questions you're very comfortable with and you're not surprised to hear them. Things like, is this up to my self-determined standard? You all have a self-determined standard, don't you? There are certain things that will not leave the studio until you put your signature on it. Well, look at the painting technically. Is it up to that? See what I mean? If the answer is yes, there's an action implied. Signed. If the answer is no, then you have to kind of do loop back to what do I do about that? When you're looking at it, ask yourself, do I need to reinforce certain forms? Have they gotten mushy? Did they get lost? Or are they all too clear? Do I need to knock some of it back? Because it's all the same amount of importance. Stuff like that. And then again, as you answer, it implies an action is required. Do I want to pop a certain point? Do I need a stronger focal point? And then if you say, yes, it's missing pop. And then you go, all right, how do I achieve pop? Then you go back into your technical loop of, well, the complementary color, or increase the contrast, or knock down the stuff around it. So you get what I'm saying about this conversation. Here's another question. Is it too light, too loose, or too tight? Probably too tight. Probably, but not everybody. So what can you do to loosen it? You know what you do? You take my workshop. Um, <laughs> that will help you with that painting. You have to actually devise, what can I do to loosen it up? And there's also the matter of, maybe I can't on this one. That's a tough kind of question to ask yourself on your painting. Did I lose this one? Is this one gone? Did I kill it? <coughs> or is it so lost that I'm going to bring it back? Or I'm so tired of it now that I'm not going to anymore? And we all know the story. You can put it over on the side for a, you know, a couple of weeks or months and then look at it again and go, oh, now I know what was wrong. So there's a time element to finishing the painting. OK. I have some other, what, I'm going to break at this point because I'm still talking at the technical level, but I don't think these are the interesting questions. But a lot of what I still know needs to be done on this painting are still technical. 
And when I looked at it at the end of my painting session yesterday, I'll tell you what I saw and what I thought. I saw a bunch of, I mean, it's still not done. If they're, oh, okay, Mac, mm -hmm. Mac has some photographs that you can start circulating through the audience, and I wish you would just keep them in motion. There's a nice big 8 by 10 and then there's a couple smaller ones. Um, what am I, I know that I have to still put in my lightest lights. I need to correct some of my blues in here. There's whole leaves and branches that I haven't painted yet. You know, so I, I left some stuff for me to do. But I also saw something that was more on um, a different level, which was, it's getting a little pretty. I thought it was getting a little too pretty. And I'm all for beautiful, but not pretty. So I realized that I need to do something to it to shake it up so that I like it. So I have to put a couple of bold things that I'm going to try in front of you that are either going to go, oh, look, was that brilliant? Or they're going to go, man, she really, she really <laughs> lost it there. And so that's, that's my nervousness in being here. Um, but I also saw, you know, I saw it's coming along, that thing I started with. It's coming along pretty good. I don't want to ruin it. But now's not the time for timidity because I, I have lots of stuff in the drawer that turned out fine, don't we? Turned out fine. I'm getting to an age and a, and a place in my artwork where I don't want to make any more fine artwork. <laughs> I'm just not satisfied. Why am I wasting my time making things that, that aren't the best I can do? So I get pig-headed and I say, I'm going to just keep working on this bugger until I either kill it or I make it something that I'm excited about. And that's another aspect of finishing. So let's take a break from, from the talk. Oh, food. <laughs> I'm also at the point where I'm, I do and don't need the glasses. And it's really irritating. So I'm going to be doing a certain amount of this. All right. I wrote myself notes yesterday. And the first one was, bring the blues into the leaves at the top right, across, fix the cross center, down in the central. OK. <laughs> um, I should also tell you while I do this, I have no idea. We're just going to put you under here. The photographs you're seeing are already a little bit manipulated on the computer to the extent that I will share the original image, the blue was almost the same top to bottom. That's all I changed on it. And I changed the mid values just a little bit more aqua. It was all just kind of this, this darkish blue, pretty much, it got a little lighter, but not much. It was pretty much the same. And I already had determined that I wanted to bring more light and more kind of this shaft of life and energy into the image. So I am making up the blues at this point, even though I'm, I'm referring to the <coughs> photograph. So I'm going to go into my, my blues. And I decided that one of the things I wanted to do was, I'm not sure I like that. Maybe I'll use that over there. I wanted to bring some of this lighter aqua energy down on a little bit more of a diagonal. <coughs> so I'm going to, yeah, it's too light. Where's the dark one? There it is. I'm going to bring it down ever so slightly. And I know I have to bring things across this middle more because it makes too much of a solid line. Now that's maybe more of the aqua than I really want. I'm even going into the dark. Heavens. OK. So now I'm going to soften that. But I, I, I just thought it was too, too even. It, it didn't have a directional energy that I was interested in. So I'm going to bring this down some more. And I'm going to darken it to the next level with a 
the purpley touch, get it more into the ultramarine, and we're going to go darker with <coughs> my real purpley aquamarine. And I'm going to try not to fall off the stage while I try to step back and see if that has any resemblance to what I was trying to do. It's a little better, but now it's, it still kind of looks like I have these two lumps of aqua. And I'm not real pleased with that, but I know that my leaves are going to take care of some of that for me. Okay, so let me bring a bit more across this metal here. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to bring the aqua across the center after all. Even though it really is quite dark in the center, this is just, I think, compositionally something that's more interesting and exciting. And you know, one thing I didn't talk about was my underpainting. And I know this is of interest to people because apparently I do it differently than most do, which is why I brought this painting that I had used for the Wednesday or Tuesday morning demo. Uh, Max also has some close-up photos of this one. And what I want you to know, and you're welcome to come up afterwards and get a closer look at, I want you to understand that I do a full painting of the image in watercolor. I don't just blob the watercolor on. I use it as one of my steps in refining composition and increasing my odds of having a successful painting after I've done all the pastel work. I do a lot of the work in the underpainting. <coughs> so when you look at this, I want you to understand that there are touches of pastel on the vertical elements. There are touches in the greens and yellows because I was working ahead of myself doing a quick demo. The whites and these lighter peach tones are pastel, some of these violets. But all of this, all of this, all of this, all of the dark that's down there, this, this, all the trees were drawn in and painted in with watercolor. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. So when you do your underpainting, are you are you thinking value as how much on scale to one to ten with value at one end and color at the other end? Where is your watercolor underpainting? Is it on its scale towards the value or on its scale towards color? In terms of scale, I will say value is is pretty important. Seven as, to as the a value to the value. Okay. And always darker, because it's working dark to light. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I say that, I go, except when I break the rules. Because um, they're my rules, I can break them. Color is a much more complicated decision. Again, it used to be just totally intuitive. I just put under there what I thought was going to look good as a conversation with the pastel. But I've been asked to teach about it, so I've kind of analyzed it. and. The general rule of thumb that I've come up with is, if it's an area where you want contrast and pop, I will tend to um, an opposite, you know, towards a complementary color. If it's an area, as in the photos that I hope Mac is passing around now of the, of the, of the woods, all those fallen leaves, you know, the whole ground is just covered with fallen leaves, except for where the rocks are and fallen branches. Um, since that's going to have a sort of monochromatic aspect to it, and I don't want the whole thing to be too jarring, I used a fairly, you know, local color or an analogous color. Thank you so much. Sure. Yes. yes. One question, Colette. <coughs> if you do watercolor, what kind of paper are you? Very good question. It's Lila, right? Lila. Lila. Yeah. Sorry, I'll say your name right. So, um, I use four ply museum board. Do you know what that is? 
It looks and feels and walks and talks like a piece of mat board, <coughs> except that it is solid 100% cotton rag stock, and it doesn't have cover sheets on either side like a piece of mat board does. It is, it is a homogeneous product, except that it's made with four ply. So if you gave it a good rip, it'll kind of rip in four layers. Mm -hmm. um, many people use museum board as a backing board for their pastel papers. <coughs> Others use it as a mat board. It comes one, two, four, and eight ply. So have you ever seen those gorgeous eight ply mats? Mm -hmm. They are probably museum board if they're using if they're, you know, using archival, but I don't know. Maybe they make eight ply uh, mat boards now. I haven't, I haven't checked that out. Then I do coat it with golden acrylic ground for pastels. Two thin coats, brushed randomly so that I'm not getting a lot of, of brush marking. Now, because I'm doing my watercolor on a textured surface that has that pastel ground, I should put this to our class this week, I have had to sacrifice the occasional brush to the pastel gods. <laughs> this, it, this used to be a lovely um, oriental wash brush, and <laughs> it's kind of sad now. But I use this for a lot of the larger areas, and the surface is just getting eaten up, I admit it. Um, Got to do what you got to oh, do. Thank you. Does that answer? Oh, yeah. Thank okay. you. So you make your own support. <coughs> you make your own support. Yeah, I buy 40 by 60, yeah. <laughs> and I chop it up. Because my favorite format is square. And we all know, why pay for a piece of paper this size when you're going to not use all that? And it's lots less expensive <laughs> than many of the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful pastel surfaces that are out there. There's just incredible surfaces, I grant you. And the other thing is, many times you're paying for that beautiful color. I want to put my own colors where I want them. I don't want it all green. So why should I pay for that? You know what I mean? Any other questions at this juncture? Okay. So, not perfect because I'm still just demoing. I'm not I can tell I'm not going to be able to finish this <coughs> All right. When I looked at this, I was not happy with the shape of that. So I am going to reassert and create a shape that I think is more interesting. I'm going to bring this down in a little fatter. All right, not perfect, but it's already better, isn't it? Doesn't look like a little skinny thing across the top there. Um, and I'm going to bring in a few dark. That's not so dark. I want. I apologize for the way I struggle in my in my pastels. I'm not a plein air painter, and so I don't use this palette very often, except when I go to teach. Because we all know where every single pastel is in our own studio. Oh, sure you do. Yeah. Oh, I do. And they're perfectly clean. And they're oh, no, all <laughs> Yeah, I have to. I have to clean them off. Uh -huh. Oh, it's that color. <laughs> That's where you went. Okay. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna fuss with that. I'm gonna go on to. I'm gonna follow my notes. Okay. It's time to establish the whitest whites on the rocks. And one of the things I wanted to play with on this painting was the idea that the rocks and the water up on the top were going to be very close value. And I'm not there yet. I want there to be a slightly ambiguous aspect. Are those rocks or are those clouds? I want to mess with you a little bit and say, is that going up to the sky? What is this? Where is it? I love that kind of ambiguity. And so sometimes I go for it quite purposely. So when I stand here and, and start laying in my whitest whites and start carving and defining, and you'll notice that I'm purposely leaving some break. At least I hope you can see some of that from that distance. Sorry. Um, the underpainting, that's where my underpainting comes in. I painted it with a soft Payne's Gray. 
that I know works really well under under rocks. And there's really not so much. And there it is. And here we're going to bring it up. And is, is that a pure white you're using? This is a Schmincke 513. So it's the, the pure white. No, not 513. That's that's the Sennelier Black. This is Schmincke 001. You know, they're pure white things. <laughs> <laughs> you could have said yes. <laughs> 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 that's what I <laughs> See, that's, I get in trouble when I try to show off. <laughs> okay, so I would spend, you know, some, some quality time here. Gee, I thought I painted enough to get to the end here today, and I can tell I'm not going to be able to do it in this amount of time. Um, but these, you know, I don't, I don't put these touches on until I am near the final stages, at least. You know, this, this kind of, of highlighting and just deciding, oh, I want a little here, and it needs a little there. And, and this is kind of rough and undetermined. And then just to wake myself up as a challenge to myself, because I told you it was getting too pretty and it didn't quite have what I wanted, I am going to put some of this whitest white up here, even if it's going to be too much. So here's where I'm uh, trying to be bold as I finish and not be timid, because I told myself I was getting too timid and it was getting too pretty. And there we need to bring in, is this it? No, it's a whole, oh, that is it. I want, I, I love this blue up here, and then I realized that's the only corner I have it. That's okay, but I, I, I want to integrate it a little more. And if I integrate it onto the rocks as well, that, you know, might be part of my way of, you know, is that water that's over it, or, or is that sky? So just having a little fun there, bringing that over mm -hmm. and including it. <coughs> All right, let me take a look at that. Do you ever blend with your fingers? Or yes. Okay. I, I take the liberty of, okay, the white in the water was good. I just mm -hmm. made that decision. I don't think it's, the marks are put down very well yet, and I have work to do. But I like the idea of there being more white. I take the liberty of finger blending or palm, you know, the side of my palm, particularly in areas like water where I don't want too much texture. So I may go like that just to knock that texture down a little bit. Um, <laughs> all this safety concern, and then I, you know, have my hand in. <laughs> um, I don't like how I got rid of too much of the aqua. Can you see what happened? So I always give myself permission, you know, to just go back and do it again. But it can be softer and softer and softer as I do that. So that's more my attitude toward finger blending is just a part of the layering process. So since I, I, I like the energy, um, of the white up here, I'm just going to really, really mess with myself because I'm trying to be great <laughs> and show you things that, you know, if you get timid at the end, you really are going to ruin the whole painting and it won't be, it won't be worth all that nice stuff that was going on. <clears throat> And why not have touches of it in here, as if these little things are are catching the light, which they would be. And you can see how at the end of the painting, these little touches of highlight are really important. That's getting better. All right, there's something else I told myself I had to do today, and I'm going to do it now. I'm going to take a big breath, and I'm going to find the right olive green. Sure I am. And that's too dark. And that's still too dark. I'm being timid. I can tell. I'm afraid of what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to take a nice big shocking one 
And that's way too garish. <laughs> so let's go with that. And that's still pretty garish. Why can I never find the right? <laughs> How many greens do you have? I bet I beat you. Yes, you do. Here, here you sir. What? Here, New Mexico, you beaten us in greens. Well, yeah, I kind of, yeah. that's, that's a problem in the Midwest, yeah. I told myself yesterday that I was going to drag some olive green down the water. Ooh. And I wish I had a big one, you know, like this. Oh, by the way, see this? <laughs> and I got a blue one like it. You've been in the presence of a sennelier giant. Okay? <laughs> um, there are times when those are just the only tool. Sometimes you need a big brush. And I'm wishing I had a big brush of olive green right now. Um, so, See why I wanted a big one? Oh, what did I do? It's okay, but I've changed the painting, haven't I? I've radically changed the painting, which is what I told myself yesterday I had to do to finish it, which is why I knew I wouldn't actually get it done today, because it needed, it needed something radical. And I think it actually needs... Um, Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. It needs to be lighter. I just have this this gut feeling that it was too safe. Of course, now I would take the cup of tea and sit down and go, okay, now what do I think of that? All right. I'm going to skip ahead. But actually, what I'm going to do it's just a little finger blending, so it isn't quite so so difficult. Colette, do you use fixatives between coats at all? If I need to, yep, absolutely. In fact, I will often um, <coughs> mask. Let's say I'm, I'm working on <coughs> rough bunches of leaves down here. I will take a rough piece of newsprint and hold that up, protect my, my water our spray fix down there so that I can work on that area. Um, you can do that five, six, seven times even and get a really nice deep crunchy texture in certain areas and then smoothers in other areas. Another way I've used it is if I'm doing a tree that has a million leaves and you're not going to paint a million leaves, I'm not going to, <laughs> but you want to get the effect of them going on drifting off into the sky. I've actually made a stencil of funny little leafy blobby shapes and then spray fixed through the stencil and all it does is darken yeah. and you know you know how it darkens mm -hmm. and then you move the stencil and do it again and you move the stencil and do it again you get this like oh what's going on back there and all you did was spray fix it a little bit what kind of fix did you use to fix thank you <laughs> I put, I'm putting that in the article though, in case you don't write that. Okay, I kind of, I kind of like the green, but what I'm going to do is support it with a darker green down in the bottom. I already have some, but I'm going to. That's not it. Not dark enough. Let's go darker, and that's too blue. Colette, I'm just really impressed. You're well, still willing to put it up there to make double check, as opposed to just going, yeah, that's wrong, yeah, that's wrong. You're still willing to put a little bit on there to see if you were right or wrong in your thought process. Yeah, that's why I have that. I don't have the best of day. And so I'm going to see. That's not. Where the heck? <laughs> I know the green I want. Well, let's. We're, we're going to go with that for now. But that's way too dark. 
So we will go with the one I said was too dark. Maybe that's what I should do when I started. Okay. I'm going to bring the dark down in, in, a, in a dark green just to see what that does. And you can see I've, I've totally, um, I'm going to have to think about that, but I've changed it enough that I can't just finish it now. <laughs> so that happens. Before I, before I stop and talk about more of the listening and, and interactive thing, I am going to do a little Thanks. bit of the leaves so you get an idea of what I was setting up here. And we're going to find the right, I'm trying to find the exact right pink beige taupe color. <laughs> and whoever has it, would you bring it up, please? <laughs> I already know that these these large leaves here, or is that other oh, picture still going around? These yeah. large leaves here are really, really important. And all of this is a setup for it. So I know that I'm going to cover up a certain amount of that green. That was like my little, I didn't tell you that, did I? I knew I was going to cover <laughs> up a lot of it. Um, but there's so much, it's, it's orange and blue. You know, so far all the leaves are kind of orangey and yellowy. So I was telling myself yesterday it had to go beigey or pink. Well, I'm going to start with this very light taupe, and I'll probably have to peach it up a little bit. But it's time for strong marks and positioning of these leaves. So I am putting pastel on really hard. And they're not exactly leaf shapes. They're just um, referential to these large leaf shapes. Mm. And I'm letting some of the orange show because I can and because it's really a beautiful orange. I don't want to lose all of it. But and then down here there's some yellow ones I know that are going to be here that are very important. <coughs> and I can invent <coughs> ones as I choose. See, I think these oranges that I laid in aren't quite tall enough, but I'll decide that as I, as I paint them in. So I'm really just making these raggedy leaf <coughs> shapes that kind of follow what's going on in the photo, but they're not, they're not literal. I'm not real excited about the color, but I am pretty pleased with the value. And as we've been all taught, we know we can fix, you know, it's more important to have the value right. And if I were truly at the finishing stages, I might be going back and forth and going, you know, that needs to be more solid, this needs to be, you know, that kind of, I might do a little tweaking. This is a pink that I'm going to bring in. Ooh, I like that. Because it's not orange. And I want a peach that is not too orange. Do I have a peach that's not too orange? Um, mm, of course not. So I'll use this one. <clears throat> and it's a little orange, but if I put it with the pink, maybe it won't bother me. It's kind of orange. <coughs> okay, let's see what I've done. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I like it better than what I brought it in. Mm -hmm. yes. How much I'll say. So Yay. I'm pleased so far. Okay, so let's talk some more about the conversation. The conversation with the paint. I'm not just thinking technique and composition and values and color, even though that's the language I've been using. Let me tell you some more of what's going on and what I think should be going on in your brains when you finish a painting. I think there's an emotional aspect. When you look at your painting, what's the first impression it gives you? Is it something that says, oh, that's unique? or I'm repulsed, <laughs> or I'm curious, 
or I'm really bored, or that's ho-hum. But you do have an emotional response when you look at your painting, if you can shut up the critic. You know, the critic can be very, very loud. But if you, if you shut up the critic long enough, you will have an emotional response. Now, that emotional response should guide you to an action. If your answer is you're bored, like my answer was, I'm a little bored. This is a little too pretty. I want to punch it up a little bit. Um, that led me to an action. If your answer is, I'm curious, then you need to think, is that curiosity a good thing? Or is it because the painting is confusing? And so I'm asking questions like, what am I doing? What is that? What is it? You know, that can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your own. You know, you're the judge. You get to decide. But the, it's the painting that's going to tell you this stuff. Does the painting have anything to offer me on my next response? You know what I'm talking about? There's the first impression and then the second impression. When you look at a painting a little longer, there's the first one. And I do this when I go to galleries. I see something that's very attractive. And my first impression is, ooh, I want to go look at that. And then sometimes I get up closer and I go, wow. Sometimes I get up closer and go, oh, not so much. So do that to your own work. Is there something at another level that, that keeps giving? Is there some depth to it? How do I feel if I were living with this painting? Is this something I want to live with? Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. You get to decide what to do about that. Maybe this is a painting you want to look at once a year and be... And, be glad that it goes somewhere else because it was painful or whatever. Maybe it's a painting that reminds you you had an epiphany moment while you painted it and it will always be precious to you. you know, but, but, but be aware that the painting is telling you that stuff. You're not always in the director's seat. You're more in a listening seat at this point of the painting. There's even a kind of a psychological or, or ethical, I don't even know what words to use. Is this painting honest? Is it honest? Am I hiding? Is this a painting I could have done with my hands tied behind my back, but I just know it's going to sell? <laughs> it's what they like me to do. It's what they expect me to do. But I'm really hiding. That was, that was a little bit in my... It was getting too pretty. Uh, and I said, yeah, I don't want to do just what I think people think I should do. So I'm going to, and I may mess some more. I don't know. But I'll send the finished painting to the people who were in the workshop. Um, was I courageous? On, you know, the flip side of that. When you look at the painting, does the painting have anything more to tell you well, than you actually intended? Did some miraculous thing happen where it is actually informing you about something? Did you ever have that happen? Where something more happened in the painting than you thought you were doing? I've had that happen a lot. Those are my favorite paintings. Because I sit back and I look at them, and I know what I was trying to do, and I know where I put all the colors, and yada, yada, yada. But I sit back and I look at it and I go, oh, you know, that makes me think about, oh, I'm really talking about, oh, I really revealed that I am, and I didn't know I revealed it, but there it is. Oh, mm. you know, have you ever had a painting show you things about yourself and then you learn? Mm -hmm. Please say yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My paintings are teaching me stuff all the time. I remember doing a series many years ago, and there was one painting that was different than the others. It was kind of blah. It was kind of low energy, and all the others weren't. And I and I looked at this whole series, and I went, "What's what's with that one?" And I came, and it taught me two things. It taught me number one. My favorite thing in life is not to do a traditional landscape. It was the one in the series that had a horizon, and the trees were above there, and the water was below, and the grass was in the middle. 
And I didn't know at that time what some of my preferences were. The painting was teaching me. The other paintings were more like this. Oh, look at those reflections. You know, but I thought for some reason that I should do an actual landscape with a horizon and all that. But it was the painting I liked the least. So it was only after I did the series that I looked at it and went, well, apparently that's not my favorite thing to do. Now, I will say it was complicated by an emotional issue. There was a death in my family right before I painted it. So it was a brother-in-law who I cared for, but I wasn't deeply, deeply close to him. And I didn't think I was affected by his loss that much. But the painting told me I was. It was there. Even beyond that thing about not wanting to do landscapes so much, I saw someone whose heart was heavy and their energy was low. And that wasn't the energy in the other pieces. So that's what I'm talking about. Does something happen in the painting that you learn about yourself? I think that's an exciting thing. And then, as far as how that affects finishing, you get to think about, do I want to reveal that? <laughs> um, the answer should be yes, because that's our job. Our job is to be brave and put it out there. Otherwise, that gives me to another question. Is it, you know, is it worth, was it worth painting? I just spent fill in the blank, three hours, one hour, three days, three <laughs> weeks, painting this thing. Was that time well spent? Of course it was time well spent. We all know that you learn from every painting, you know, the process, the doing, again, blah, da, 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 da. But this painting, is the result worth the time and effort and sweat and tears and agony that I put into it? That's another way you can judge the painting and have it tell you, yeah, I worked. Or no, I don't. And that's, those are some of the questions I ask when I'm deciding what to do as I finish. And on that same level, is it worth, I love this one, I think it's really important, is it worth anybody else's time and energy to look at it? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But if you think it was for you, and you think there's some truth in it, if you think there was value, if you think there was something revealed or something that worked, and you want to share that with the world, then yeah, that's cool. But I think it's a fair question to ask. Why should anybody else spend their time and energy looking at this? Is it worth, you know, they got a lot of stuff they can look at. <laughs> you know, why should they look at yours? And, and you're not painting for them. But I think you ought to give them some value, not just, you know, your private therapy session. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Whatever. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up, and I, I didn't lie, I didn't finish the painting. <laughs> I will finish and I will send. But um, is the painting alive? Does it have its own existence now? Is it ready to go out in the world? Does it have its own light? I, I'm going to have a show with a watercolor friend who's also an architect who has spent a lot of time delving into the topic of inner light that any great work of art he feels, be it a building or a painting or a dance, creates its own light. And again, he's using light in a very large metaphorical sense. But I do look at my paintings after all our discussions that I've had with him. Does it have its own light? Does it bring a sense of energy to the world? Am I proud of it is another good question. Um, I know of an architect who wrote about the experience of sitting in a finished building. It happened to be a house of worship. So it was something that was very, very important to him and very near to his heart and his spirit. And he was sitting in the building before the, the day before the, the great opening, you know, where everybody would come and go, ah, oh, and all that sort of thing. But he was sitting in the building by himself. And he wrote that 
it wasn't alive yet. It was just a place. And that later that day, he visited it again. And that he himself got a completely different energy feeling that somehow the building had awakened and had its own entity. It was its own self. And it was, as he said, I, I, he says, for lack of a better word, the building had come to life. And he felt that he was in some place important, not just <coughs> this structure that he had created. And so sometimes I ask my paintings, are you alive? Are you no. there yet? You know? <laughs> um, is there an energy in you that is, that is yours now? Have the materials, these, these, these humble materials of dust and pigment that we walk on, you know, that we tread upon and we think nothing of dust, but we're painting with dust. And yet <clears throat> dust is imbued with a kind of life and energy because it's imbued as with, with part of creation. So when we take that dust and we arrange it and throw it on a piece of paper, we are also participating in creation. And I would challenge you, when you decide if a painting is finished or not, you know, Take a look and ask yourself, what hath I created? You know, use, use big important language if you want to, use hath. <laughs> but ask yourself, is this something, you know, is it ready to go out in the world and, and have its place? So that's my story about the questioning process, the listening process, um, the implications to technique and action that are implied in the answers to all these questions, but that's that's my story about how to finish Questions? <coughs> Pastels, what do you like best? I can pick them up and put them down, even weeks between or hours between. That's why I started in pastel. I was a mom, and I, I had trouble. And I, I'd gotten sick, I think, from some of the the oil painting fumes that I was using, you know, in a studio that wasn't designed for it. Mm -hmm. And a friend told me that pastels had the same mindset as oils, working dark to light and layering and building up surfaces and scraping and scumbling together. Um, but they were faster. You could just pick them up, put them down, ready to go. And, oh my gosh, the colors. <laughs> and your favorites? Brand. My favorite brand. Can't. Soft or dark? Uh, soft, soft. Soft. But I'll tell you, I have certain colors and certain brands. Mm -hmm. So I, I mentioned that it was the Schminky White. Mm -hmm. Couldn't paint without the Schminky White. Mm -hmm. You know, couldn't paint without Sennelier 179 and 177. <laughs> couldn't paint. And I've discovered a brand new one I can't live without. The, the new um, Richeson. I got to find out what yeah. number this one is. I'm like, oh. Oh, and I looked at all my blue violets. I've got Richeson, I've got Blick, I've got Schminke, Unison, Terry Ludwig, Great Americans, a um, couple other things. Rocher. Oh, yes, I have some Rocher. <laughs> <laughs> Although they may have this one since I only have about five Rochers, you know. <laughs> but I didn't have this color, so now I got to add this to my got to have list. So yeah, I'm all over on the brands, for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. As always, it makes me learn the most. When you ask me to teach or demo, I learn the most, so thank you.